explore more possibilities. I think one of the things that I've been, I think one of the things I'm good at is uh, looking at things from a different perspective. I mean, what I consider my work to be doing is molecular biology in reverse. So for instance, typically people think of a DNA fingerprint as an essential aspect, uh, an essential picture of one's identity. Uh, your essential identity, an unchanging glyph that could have been placed in your cells by Mother Nature herself. I take just the opposite perspective, that, that the DNA image is a laboratory construct that has that, that is, uh, is changeable depending on, on every single condition of that lab or any lab you go to, that the DNA fingerprint tells us as much about the laboratory as it does about the individual. So I like to, I, I often will uh, discover through through inversion, through through allowing a kind of uh, a thought process to occur that sees things perhaps the opposite way to how we're trained to read that narrative. Uh, I think I can you know I think game design I guess I would suggest to do the same thing to begin by looking at the opposite of assumptions and you can begin by looking backwards at the way one is supposed to play, sort of interrogating every single concept of the field and and thinking of it in reverse. There will be people that grow up with games whose entire lives are affected by those games. And game designers have a moral obligation in the sense that they're creating addictive media. Um, they're creating essentially habit-forming, chemically habit-forming media. I think that um, it is only a matter of time before some politician somewhere basically looks at a lot of these social games and says, um, these are certain types, this encourage certain types of human behavior and they need to be regulated. To me, when I hear limits, I start thinking legislation, I start thinking um, constraints, and in a very broad context, you would say, yeah, maybe limits, but I really say no, I think we have to self-regulate from within. It's very similar to being a surgeon, for example. You know, like when surgeons, and it's, it's funny because there's no, like, Hippocratic oath that, that game designers have to, and maybe that's what this is all about. It, there's, there's in other fields, in other disciplines, there are a set of standards that you sort of have to abide by, or expectations that you have that you will not use your powers for evil. And I think that game designers face a very similar challenge in that the game designers are very good at getting, uh, getting people to do certain types of things or participate in certain types of behaviors. Not always in predictable ways, but certainly there's an intentionality there. Uh, and so I think that the more obligations for game designers is that they need to figure out what are the appropriate ends, what do they want their games to do, and hopefully those line up with things that are good for the world. Gamification is something which is a sort of trend at the moment. Everybody, if you look at the TED Talks going on, uh, a lot of people are talking about how to implement game rules, game play mechanisms into everyday interfaces like car navigation or whatever. And the basic idea behind gamification is how to motivate people to do stuff they perhaps wouldn't want to do. So it can also yeah. have very negative uh, impacts. It's not just good per se to make life more game-like. I think that uh, play and uh, more than games because I like to differentiate the two always um, has a has a kind of an ethical uh, ethical feature. Um, it's um, I, I I would like to refer to a book I really like by Pat Kane. It's called The Play Ethic, and uh, he he talks a lot about this. He says how play ethic follow the work ethic and um, he, he describes exactly how to, to be a player also means to care and to collaborate. So I think that this is this is a, the point of interest. If, if we want to, to change something through to play, it has to come from this side. It has to come from, from caring, from inventing, from creating, from uh, wanting to, to be with the other person and work the other person without necessarily see the, the competitive part of it. My prediction is that over the course of you know the next 50 years or 100 years or whatever, this moment where we sat down in front of screens and played games and held things in our hands, that will seem like a very strange period. It will seem very archaic that we did this where we stood in front of this large arcade cabinet and we played a game. I mean, I think that this sort of distinction between what we do in our game lives and what we do in our real lives is going to completely disappear, um, I mean, which really excites me. I think that that's really, that's really exciting. In, in particular, if it's 
helping with real world behavior, social interaction, participation, making friends, those sorts of things. Um, and I think that we will be playing lots of games without even thinking of them necessarily as games. At least um, how we think about game systems will become so embedded in our everyday existence that we won't even be able to make the distinction anymore between sort of playing the game and being playing the game and living our real lives. I think it's going to take uh, several decades of people passing away, literally dying, um, and new people <laughs> filling their shoes who grew up with Mario and who grew up with uh, you know, Pac-Man, uh, and maybe even further than that, maybe even people that grew up with Mario Kart, you know, um, to actually understand that these game dynamics could be civically functional uh, structures for 